Hello, in this video I'm going to show you how I captured this photo of the elephant's trunk nebula with just an entry-level DSLR and a camera lens. That's right, no telescopes whatsoever. And I was shooting that from a light polluted Bortle 7 class sky and I only integrated for, believe it or not, 32 minutes because then unfortunately the clouds rolled in. So obviously I had a lot of struggles and a lot of challenges that I managed to figure out and I wanted to share them with you in this video. So let's get started. All right, so let's start with 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 the beginning. So the when I when I have set up my my camera rig, the first challenge that I had to face was the fact that uh, I couldn't see any stars in my live view preview, and that is because I was, uh, like I said, I was in the Bortle Seven class zone. So I figured that if I want to shoot a nebula, it's a good idea to use some kind of a filter, and the filter of choice that I used is a dual band Optolong L Enhance. And there's a newer one, the Alextreme, which is like an updated version, but they don't manufacture them as clip-in filters. The, the only clip-in filter from these that is available for Canon APS-C cameras is the L Enhance, so that's why I got this one. The filter looks like this and uh, it blocks a ton of light. It actually only passes a very, very narrow band around the hydrogen alpha emission line and also around the oxygen 3 emission line. So uh, this is very good to capture emission nebula. But what I didn't actually realize, which is kind of obvious, is that because this filter cuts out so much of the spectrum of light, if I put a camera lens here that at 300 millimeters, this is the Canon 70 to 300, my good old trusty lens, at f5.6 with this filter and with the camera that goes with ISO only to 6400, I literally could not see anything. So I tried to, I, you know, I checked everything, the lens cap was off, the, I had like rough focus on infinity and I couldn't see anything. What I did in order to actually find focus is that I, um, luckily Jupiter was behind me, so I uh, pointed the camera at Jupiter and luckily I did see Jupiter in live view here. So I put off my, put on, uh, my button of mask. I took a picture of Jupiter, fine-tuned the focus a little bit. As you can see, the diffraction spikes are barely visible with this filter and everything. One um, one thought that I had is, you know, the clip-in filter is a pretty cool design because you can use it with any lens, any telescope or whatever. But if, he, if Optolong or some kind of other filter manufacturer actually made a screw-in filter like on the on the top of our lens, what you could do is find your focus, find your target, find everything, and then put on the filter. And the focusing and finding the target would be so much easier without the filter in. But obviously, if I take it off, I will lose focus with my autofocus lens. So I have to find focus and everything with the filter inside. So focusing at Jupiter was the solution for that. So the next step was to actually find my target. So I extended uh, this lens to uh, to 300. I taped the focus ring and everything like I usually do so that I can take my flats without worrying about the lens creeping down when I put my iPad on top of that. And at equivalent of 480 millimeters of focal length with this APS-C camera, um, it was it, it could be quite a challenge to find my target. And normally finding a target with um, with a with a, with a tracker that doesn't have a go-to system like I was using the the, the Scar Star Adventure. Of course, this is the tracker that I have, the only tracker that I have right now. And normally it would be quite a challenge, but luckily uh, a couple of weeks ago, I have developed this kind of a, sort of like a go-to system for the Star Adventure, which means that I can use the dial on the back of the Adventure and also the declination scale that I have added to my uh, to my declination bracket right here. I have uh, actually two videos about this subject. If you haven't checked them out, this is a fantastic thing that you have, you can do if, to your Star Adventure. Definitely check them out. The first one will be linked up here. I had great comments from people from the community that they tested it out and it actually works. So definitely check it out if you haven't already. And I use this go-to system. I figured out my celestial coordinates and I blindly pointed at the spot where I, where I thought that 
Elephant's Trunk Nebula would be. And the position was pretty much spot on. I didn't do any corrections whatsoever. And if I had to, it would be such a pain of, again, not seeing anything in live. You would have to take a photo, reframe, take another photo, compare, etc., etc. So uh, let's actually jump into Stellarium because uh, there is one other thing that I wanted to show you. All right, so we are here in Stellarium and I have centered on the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. As you can see, this is uh, this nebula right here. And I was trying to center on this star right here. I have uh, I had this star selected and I have read the hour angle and the declination. I have plugged it into my go-to system and then the framing was pretty much spot on. Uh, one thing that I wanted to do is that, hang on, let me go actually to equatorial. Yeah, that's right. One thing that I wanted to do, as you can see, this is my, my simulated framing with this red box. And if you don't know about this feature, this is amazing. You can, you can activate it by clicking on this button right here. And then you can pretty much uh, here with this wrench, you can define your, your lenses, you can define your sensors. I have like two cameras here. I have my telescopes, which are pretty much like lenses with, with certain focal lens. And then you can you can activate this and you can switch between cameras, you can switch between your, your telescopes. Here you have some Barlow's extenders, whatever, you can activate them here. And you can check your framing. If you go to this equatorial uh, view, then this is what you would get uh, if you're using an equatorial mount, like the Star Adventure is an equatorial mount. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to have the trunk actually on the bottom of my frame. I wanted to have this kind of a rectangle with the trunk on the bottom. So I figured that I could rotate this field. With these buttons, you can actually rotate your field. So minus 90 degrees. This is what I wanted to achieve. And uh, with my setup, I can achieve that because I have a lens color on which I can just freely rotate my camera. So what I did is I rotated it like this. I rotated it like this and I use it with this rotation. But as it turns out, I actually got, uh, the shots that I got were actually turned 90 degrees with regards to what I saw here in Stellarium. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. Maybe it's because the home position for the adventure, at least like the position of the right ascension, which corresponds to the zero hour angle is actually not upright, but it is actually horizontal like this. So in this position, my camera is actually flat, you know, not rotated at all. So I would, I assume that I would have to apply rotation to this home position, the zero hour angle position. So rotate it like this and then shoot with this orientation. And that way I would get the framing that I see here in Stellarium. So this is a pretty cool way to kind of visualize, visualize your framing. Uh, but again, the accuracy of the go-to system, I am, I am really impressed uh, by that. So honestly, I would venture to say that if I didn't have this go-to system figured out for the adventure, given the fact that I didn't see anything on the live view, I wouldn't probably be able to find this nebula like at all. And of course, uh, after I have set up everything, uh, I have set up my, my auto guiding, I have set my laptop in the field. Um, the, the, the camera that I'm using is the Canon uh, 2000D in Europe, which is Canon T7 in the US, and I have it Astro modified. This is an excellent little entry level, uh, entry level camera that is very capable for astrophotography. Check it out. I will link it down below also. Very, very good choice if you are on a budget. And then I was off to the races. I thought uh, that I had a pretty good night b b before me, but I was so wrong because after like half an hour, the clouds rolled in and really ruined my day. I was I was taking four minutes subframes, uh, four minutes uh, with an auto guider, and then I took uh, only eight of them, which gives me like 32 minutes of integration. And one other tip that I would give you if you're auto guiding in the field and you don't have access to to power up your computer. I have this, I recently picked up this power bank from Mofi. This is the Mofi uh, Power Station Pro. I think that's the name of this power bank. And it is capable of actually charging a MacBook Pro in the field. If I turn off any other software that I don't need, except for PhD2, of course, I can actually really, really slowly charge my laptop via this power bank, which means that I can run the laptop in the field for extended periods of time even though this MacBook is pretty old and on its own internal battery it runs like runs out of juice in like an hour or an hour and a half. So with this thing, I can extend this quick little tip. 
So after I had to call it the night after only 32 minutes, I was kind of skeptical. I was like, oh, am I even going to be able to pull out anything out of that and in post-production? But I thought, you know, let's give it a try. And I actually just watched second time <laughs> an excellent tutorial in PixInsight, which I will mention in, in, in just a moment in detail. So let me show you a couple of key moments in the editing and what I did to, to come up with this image. So. Right here, uh, as you can see in PixInsight, this is the version of the image. Mm. This is the version of the image after after stacking, of course, because I took the calibration frames. So I have stacked everything, aligned everything, uh, and then I run an automatic background extraction in PixInsight. Then I run color calibration, SCNR to remove the green noise, uh, and then I stretch it using the auto stretch. And this is pretty much how the image looks. This is actually also after initial denoising. And as you can see, there is a very, very little detail visible here. Here is the garnet star, here is the elephant's trunk, here is the trunk itself. And I was kind of skeptical because, you know, you don't see a lot of contrast in this photo and I would have to stretch it a lot, which means introduce new noise in order to, to pull out anything out of this image. But, you know, I give it a shot. The denoising plugin that I used is called Easy Processing Suite. Uh, easy denoise. This is a free plugin that you can download, and it has uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good opinions, uh, reviews on the internet. So I, I think I would definitely recommend that one. I will put a link down below in the description to this plugin. So I run that, uh, and then the the core part, like the most important part of the processing, because I really wanted to, it, this image to look in this kind of a Hubble palette uh, color color schema, if you will. So instead of having it in those kind of a reddish colors i wanted this beautiful contrast between golden and blue colors and that is where the this tutorial comes into play this tutorial is from luke from the youtube channel Lucomatico, and i will definitely put a link down below in the description actually i can even link it here this is his tutorial and this is amazing it's quite of a long video but he goes through every single step from the stacked image to his final photo of the signals wall which by the way looks incredible look good job mate and his channel is i think very underrated he has excellent quality content so definitely check it out and he basically shows how to process an image taken with a dual narrowband filter like the Optolong L Enhance uh, and a one-shot color camera like a, like a DSLR and turn it into a Hubble-like palette. So this tutorial is excellent. And basically the gist here uh, in, in, in short words is that you split the channels uh, and then because you are shooting in dual narrowband, so in the red channel you have the hydrogen alpha and then in the blue and the green channel you have the oxygen. Uh, and um, you can actually discard the blue channel completely because all of this data is in the green channel, but the green channel is cleaner because there are twice as many green pixels in a bare filter array. And then you can synthesize uh, the third channel using a combination of the red and the green, and then you can put it all together using an LRGB, LRGB combination uh, function in PixInsight. So uh, let me show you actually the two versions of this image. Uh, I have also run a, a starnet to separate the nebulosity from the stars because that way you can really do like heavy processing on the nebula itself and then put it back together afterwards with the stars. So here is pretty much how this image looks uh, after separating the nebula from the stars and also after stretching the image even more with, with curves adjustment. And then I, I think I have run another denoise and as you can see the nebula starts to pop out really well here i have horrible splotches of, of of color noise here on the edges this is one of the reasons why i um, ultimately decided to crop it into a square one to one uh, ratio in order to get rid of those ugly ugly corners and ugly edges but it starts to gain some shape and this is still in the true color and then I will show you an image uh, after doing the channel manipulation from, from the tutorial from Luke. And I think it is uh, this one. And as you can see, the colors are vastly different. Instead of having this dominating red color, we have this Hubble-like palette with, with golden and blue colors. As you can see, this image still looks pretty ugly. I had to finish it off in, in Photoshop. I used Camera Raw, uh, Adobe Camera Raw filter in order to further denoise the image. I cropped it into one to one, and then I um, I did one other thing that I actually wanted to show you in Photoshop. So here this uh, here is actually the the final photo in Photoshop, but I wanted to show you uh, one particular step. So if I 
if I go back here, uh, here is some some step actually without even bringing in the back the stars because I brought back the stars uh, here in Photoshop. Uh, I wanted to get rid of uh, some of the noise still. This is after the Adobe Camera Raw here. Uh, this filter. Let me actually select this. The Adobe Camera Raw filter, but I actually run a dust and scratches uh, on this. Uh, so as you can see, this is the dust after the dust and scratches without this mask. And as you can see, this is pretty aggressive. I have lost a lot of detail in my nebula, but I have also killed a lot of this ugly noise here. And then what I did as a very cool trick is I added a layer mask. If I activate this mask, as you can see, this is without it. This is with it. And this mask pretty much um, I painted it on the edges and a little bit in the middle here and just gently here with like a low flow and very very low hardness in order to kind of you know find the right balance between like preserving the details in the in the fine edges uh, in, in my nebula but also kind of uh, smoothing out the areas with with less detail using this layer with dust and scratches so like you see i had to use a lot of tricks to to come up with with the final image and and the main reason why i had to work so much with the denoising and everything is because i had so little data 32 minutes with with a camera lens like this at f5.6 is not a lot if i had uh, if i had used a rasa telescope for instance which has a focal ratio of f2 I would pretty much gather the same amount of light as I would with this lens if my math is correct in four hours. In 30 minutes with a Rasa I would collect the same amount of photons as with this lens in four hours. So, so that's why if you have a <laughs> heavy and expensive telescope you can you can you know save a lot of time and that's where your money really really is. But you know, anyway you know I think that the final image that I come up with is pretty cool uh, anyway especially if you want to like share it online or something let me know down below in the comments what do you think about this image. And one uh, thing that I wanted to bring up uh, at the end of this video is that the beauty of astrophotography is that I can actually use this data that I have collected I can come back to the same target on the next clear night shoot more exposures maybe integrate for another hour two or three and then add this data that I have collected previously to the new data and then keep like refining this image so and anyway let me know what you think about this this stuff in, in the comments down below uh, if you like this video please give it a like and also check out my patreon page which i have launched just recently the link will be down below in the description if you would like to have any kind of like influence on what kind of videos do i make in the future if you would like to have access to future videos before i publish them on youtube then those are kind of the perks that you would get if you do support me on Patreon, so just check that out. And of course, if you haven't subscribed already to my channel, please consider subscribing. I will be posting a lot more videos uh, on this subjects and, and, and related. So hopefully, see you next time. Clear skies and bye-bye.